Great. Thank you. Dawn, do you have some updates or housekeeping, odds and ends? Yeah, um, we have uh, started uh, asking agencies if they'd like to do fidelity reviews again, and those are incentivized. Um, and we have options for agencies to be fidelity reviewers, to host a baseline review, uh, to do a follow-up review if they've already had a baseline, and that's in, in either supported employment or supportive housing. And then we have a new uh, category where we are building our fidelity reviewer cadre so that we have additional lead reviewers. And that means contracting with an agency that a person works for if they want to be a lead reviewer. They also have to have gone through our training in order to, to do that. And so if folks are interested, they can reach out to me and I can discuss in greater detail kind of outside of here. But uh, that's our that's our latest announcement. <laughs> Any other announcements or items, odds and ends before we get started? All right, well, welcome everyone. As you can see here on the slide, the webinar is hosted by DBHR through the Washington State Healthcare Authority. And it is an interactive, webinar slash learning community um, really designed to hear from one another, um, get some some updates from Dawn and Darren regarding uh, the FCS SE side of things, um, but overall really a space to share information and learn from one another. They are always sort of grounded or framed under a topic. Today's topic is looking at accommodations and supports for individuals. But again, um, please reach out to Dawn. Let us know here on the call if there are any special topics or interests that you'd like to see for future calls. It is the job developers community of practice. I think we're trying to change um, change that a bit to have it be a little more all encompassing of other employment support. So traditionally it's been really heavily emphasized um, around job development, which we can continue to touch on that. As you can see today is um, more of a general overview that would be helpful for anyone, even if you're not doing job development. Dawn, do you wanna add anything to that? I, I think, as always, you've done well. So <laughs> nothing to add. <laughs> um, and you'll get copies of the presentation and the recording after today's webinar. So we'll get started. And as I mentioned, we are recording. Um, so just be mindful of that. Sometimes it's best to keep the cameras off in, in, until you're ready to talk or we're, um, you know, discussing something, but certainly, um, you know, if you feel more engaged with the cameras on, you, you can do that as well. So we're really looking at finding the right support, helping job seekers or employees that you're working with identify accommodations to support them on the job. Um, many times finding those accommodations or assessing the need for an accommodation is somewhat daunting, uh, not quite knowing what some of the functional implications of the mental health condition are. So we're gonna walk through how to begin some of that assessing. As you all know, this is a 60 minute call. Uh, we also carve in some time to talk about successes and challenges to help us identify future topics. So uh, obviously we can't cover everything, but I've included lots of resources and information for you to pursue any additional information or, around certain topics. But I think we are going to get started. But before we officially get started, you can use the chat, unmute your mic. What comes to mind when you think of supports for job seekers or employees? What are some what are some things that come come to your mind when you think about 
job supports, the golden elevator speech. Okay, um, Virginia, can you explain that? Reasonable accommodations, Heather mentions, okay. Transportation yes. to get there, go ahead. So the golden elevator speech is the speech that um, goes, uh, yeah, it's reasonable to ask for an elevator, but we're not gonna supply you a golden elevator. Okay. So um, in our, um, in our company, um, we, people who seek accommodation sometimes get that speech, like maybe the department can't accommodate you. Okay. So, um, when you think of supports comes to mind, sadly, um, and unfortunately that sometimes those supports or accommodations can't be addressed or can't be accommodated for. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Paula writes access to reliable and affordable childcare, vocational counseling and open communication with the employee's supervisor. So having that opportunity to meet with the supervisor um, as a job coach or employment specialist is an accommodation or support. What types of supports do you use in your professional life that you're comfortable sharing? So if you think about the supports we just identified or what comes to mind when you think about supports, what types of supports do you use in your professional life? Let's see what we have here. Telework, flexible schedule. Yes, I was thinking the same thing for me, that option, childcare. Yes, thank you, Teresa. What other types of supports? Sonia, my supports open door policy with management. I have a, let me see, for some reason that's hidden, a very supportive manager. Yes, that's that's certainly a, a professional support, family support, a reliable vehicle, transportation services. So yes, um, those are all types of supports that you use. Also, I'm provided with a whiteboard and any supplies I need to keep track of tasks. I love it, Virginia. So, and you know, the having those um concrete tools are, are helpful. Um, what about this third question? How have these supports assisted you in your job? So if you think about what you just identified as the types of supports, how have they assisted you in your work? Uh, so I think Sonia raised her hand as well. Teresa, having great coworkers. Christina, having conversation with the person and asking what they need and make sure person-centered goal sheets so we can meet those goals. Absolutely. Um, uh, Sonia? Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. So just uh, some personal disclosure. Um, I have uh, ADHD and uh, bipolar disorder. So for me, organizational skills do not come naturally. Mm -hmm. And um, it's good to basically have the uh, have a wide variety of organizational tools, but also to be able to go to my supervisor and say, you know what, I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. I have all these projects. I'm not entirely sure what is supposed to be priority or how would you like this done? And um, I can basically rely that on her uh, feedback saying, okay, you know what, let's go ahead and put this on the back burner and bring this forward. And then that way, you know, everything feels just a little bit more manageable. Sonia, I appreciate your self-disclosure, and that's such a wonderful example of what we're going to talk about today. Um, prioritizing, support that's a support, that could be an accommodation, meeting with your supervisor and having your supervisor be able to meet with you and walk you through what some high priority tasks might be for that week or month, um, and what ones, like you said, Sonia, can be put on the back burner. Um, so we're going to be talking about all of those types of accommodations and supports. I'm just going to look here in the chat to make sure. Uh, flexible schedule, Virginia wrote, essential in the winter in the Northwest. The sun sets at four uh, something in December. So seasonal affective disorder is essential. Um, it's an endemic in this region. Whiteboard helps me to organize for the day. Absolutely. Agency focuses on self-care. Yes. Um, 
even some assistive technology. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, you know, different apps that you might use. I know for me, you know, I am completely transitioned professional and personal appointments to my um, my calendar app. And if it's not on my calendar app, sometimes it gets just popped off my schedule. Um, that's, you know, a, a, a technology that I use, or I have different apps that I use to, you know, help me in, with breathing, different mindfulness apps and other types of guided meditation or other types of deep breathing and relaxation exercises that help me to manage stress and anxiety that I feel. So we're going to talk about some different methods to assess the employment implications or functional implications of mental health conditions. So how does the mental health condition affect or impact your the person's employment? Uh, also explore ways to determine the need for accommodations and other supports and skill development. So we're not just, we're talking primarily about accommodations today, but certainly as you're kind of exploring ways to assess and determine different accommodations, other skill development areas might develop as well and apply accommodations to address specific work-related support needs. But as always, hearing from the group what you've encountered over the past month or two months um, that has been successful or challenges, things that maybe you want to discuss with others here on the call that you could get some feedback around. So what are some challenges or maybe we start with successes that people have had over the last month or two that you'd like to share with the group? Laura, did you unmute to say something? Oh, no, sorry. No, that's okay. I, I've sometimes, I when I see someone unmute, I just think that they might have something that they want to say. Are there challenges or successes? You know, let's let's focus on those successes. Monica, having the right equipment, uh, desk and monitors. Yes, kind of going back to what we were talking about with the accommodations, but being able to have kind of what is needed certainly is a success. And it can be job development success, Virginia Success has started a disabilities caucus for professionals in our company and found other neurodivergent people and people with disabilities to discuss it with. Oh, that's wonderful. Maybe that's something in the future we can kind of explore a little bit more, Virginia, to see what you've done. Maybe that's something that could be helpful to others on the call. I love that idea. Any other successes or challenges we could even move into? Problem areas that we might be able to provide some support from one another while we're here on the call, using this monthly call as a way to not only gain some information or, around relevant topics, but also get that support from one another. See, see what others have tried. Uh, Brooks chat mentions, I've been partnering more closely with DVR to support members with finding jobs and that fit their needs and setting up accommodations. Yes. So um, getting back to the successes, that's a great success. Getting my member excited about work, they're very closed off and always has a no answer. He struggles with mental health and is on his last chance at his job. However, he won't own his mistake. So Christina, it sounds like um, you're experiencing some challenges with um, someone who's kind of at his last chance with the, with the job and maybe limited recognition of some of the problem areas that might be encountering. Uh, Virginia, challenge, staying motivated and focused, getting things done when they're boring tasks. I hear you with that. <laughs> um, you know, staying focused, like you mentioned here in New Jersey, the sun's setting a little bit later. Um, 
but not much. And yeah, sometimes it's just staying motivated ourselves and staying um, engaged and, and excited and focused is, is a problem. So kind of looking at just briefly, maybe Christine, Christina's um, discussion here in the chat, has anyone had a similar experience that um, getting someone or, or, or helping someone become motive, interested and excited about work and uh, particularly if the person is closed off and um, maybe only responds with a yes or no answer or in this case a no answer, um, struggling with mental health and on the last chance at his, at his job um, and not owning his mistakes or are others in similar have similar experiences or similar challenges that Christina identifies and how have been some ways that you've been able to address this? Someone who isn't very forthcoming with information, it sounds like, maybe responds and just kind of yes or no uh, without giving much information and helping to get someone excited and, and focused and interested. So think about it, if there's any insight or suggestions or support that you can provide, Christina, maybe based on your own experiences, how you might've addressed that situation Brooke mentions talking to members about the barriers they face to equipment and using the JAN website to find potential solutions has been helpful. So exploring potential solutions with people. So I helping a member, helping a job seeker look at what some of the problems might've been and then also exploring some, some solutions, letting someone see that there are solutions or potential solutions to the problem. Monica, encourage positive responses. For example, what went right today? I love it. So identifying those positive moments of the day or the week. I, I, what a phenomenal response. And Christina, I don't want to push him and cause more harm. So I wish I knew how to get him to at least try. Thanks for any help. So, you know, that's, I, 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 I can see in your writing and, and how you're expressing this, that this is a concern and a challenge. Um, and you've gotten some good suggestions so far, what went right today, focusing on the positive, sharing solutions that might help, exploring different outcomes that might be um, positive outcomes. Uh, Virginia writes, no, but I've been that person, empathy, listening, the obstacles, I felt like I had, yes, having just, just having those active listening skills on, right? Actively listening, um, maybe providing some affirmations and, and, you know, identifying those positive and those strengths that the person has. There are often hidden obstacles and maybe sometimes imagined ones. Virginia mentions, yes, empathy through nonviolent communication techniques are designed for this situation. Yes. So being empathic, validating that the, that the process is hard while also focusing on what went right and the strength it took to get through what didn't, what hasn't worked for, and get through what didn't has worked well for me. Yes. Um, so it sounds like Christina, uh, thank you so much. I'll be trying a new approach utilizing your suggestions. Let us know how it goes. And again, this is what this group is designed to do. It's not just designed to be a webinar. Um, you have those, you have other formats and other webinars. This is really to hear from one another, get those, um, get that support, get some suggestions, provide that very needed peer energy, you know, from one another, every, every, um, I used to be, belong to a job coach network when I was a job coach a while back and 
just every quarter we would meet and it would just be such an opportunity to hear from others who were more experienced than me or or the same level of experience or less experienced, but encountering similar difficulties and obstacles, but also um, hearing a different perspective of how they've managed and handled that. I was going to say, Joni, that, and I apologize, I missed the first part of the conversation because I had to step away for a minute, but um, I had a gal on my caseload once a bunch of years ago that um, was very resistant to working in general and made it very clear that, um, you know, she wasn't going to cooperate with me. And, you know, she was there because her TANF worker, uh, temporary assistance for needy families worker had referred her and said she needed to find a job. And, and so what we went through was, you know, work doesn't have to be a pain. It can be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And um, talked about what she did for fun. And it turned out she loved horses. And we figured out a way to get her connected with ranchers so that she took care of their horses when they were on vacation. She went from prickly and unpleasant to be around to smiling and 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 became employed when when we made it very clear it could be something she enjoyed. It didn't have to be, you know, McDonald's, which is what she said she absolutely would not do ever, ever, ever. <laughs> I love it, Dawn. So talking with people about what's important to them, what what do they want to do? Inquiring about hobbies and interests and how maybe some of those features of whatever the hobby or interest is can be found in certain positions. I, I love it. Um, yeah, Teresa, I agree. That's amazing. That's a great success, Dawn. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to move into our content, but just be mindful for future calls. If you want to come kind of prepared to talk about a challenge or a success, you know, we usually have time to talk about at least one, like we did with Christina, um, before we get into the content. But I want to kind of preface this with, you know, the rationale for accommodations in the work setting. And we answered that question a little bit earlier when I asked what types of supports do you use professionally and how have they helped? And uh, the benefits of those supports. So the rationale for accommodations are very similar. Um, there are different functional implication issues that might be related to the person's mental health condition um, and barriers that need to be addressed. And an accommodation can uh, help with that. Accommodations can include um, different tools, assistive technology tools, different strategies, similar to what was mentioned earlier about having a supervisor sit and plan and help prioritize. Um, in my experience working in support and employment, oftentimes it's um, difficult to really uh, understand what might be need to be accommodated for, what accommodations might be helpful, for, what we're gonna say functional implications, what types of, of obstacles or barriers is the person encountering that an accommodation can help. So we're, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the different types of supports for employees. So many of you in your earlier response to, to those questions I posed, um, natural supports. So people who are natural in that person's life, family, friends, coworkers, community support. So, you know, having access to the library, public transportation, of places of worship, adult education classes. So all of those types of community supports are available to employees. And I'm mentioning these because sometimes we forget that there are other supports that can be supportive and helpful and assistive to individuals in their employment or even their job search. Um, Formal supports are those public or private agencies that assist individuals with disabilities, um, and then accommodations and assistive technology. Today, we're really focusing on that accommodations piece. So if you think about um, identifying the different supports in your community, maybe define the role that that particular support might play for people in your in your services or that you're working with, um, what challenges or barriers 
would some people face to accessing that support? So really think through, you know, yes, it's great that we're identifying natural supports or community supports, but what are some challenges or barriers that people might have to accessing those supports? And then maybe develop like a resource list, whether it's, you know, a, a legit bound folder or online, you know, um, resources that, that could be easily updated with contact information, access information, how to, how to access that support. Are there contact people? Are there, is there an application process? If you were thinking about different types of transportation supports, um, I know here in New Jersey, we have um, access link. It's uh, transportation for individuals with disabilities and it's a, a, an application process, you know, creating a list of resources in your community and what the actual process is to access those um, resources. When we think about accommodations, we'll get into what those are. Little brief overview of the ADA, very, very brief. Assistive technology um, can be defined as any item or device or maybe piece of equipment that people can use to maintain or improve um, their independence or, or in this case, uh, their employment. And for many people, it can be really the difference between equal access in, in the employment setting and, and not having that access. Uh, Heather wrote, here's a fun barrier, employers basing their accommodations off of a list rather than what the individuals are requesting needs. I, Heather, and that's why today, equipping you all with the skills to identify and help the person really explore what would be the best accommodation for that person rather than relying on a list of accommodations, a canned list that the uh, person has. I would love to hear a little more about that, Heather, if you have, um, if you're able to unmute and just kind of chat a bit about what you're seeing um, and what that list looks like and how that's posing difficulties or a problem. Um, so I don't remember the name of the website. We can't quite hear you. I don't know if it's... Um... Sorry. Okay, th okay, there you go, that's much better. Okay, <laughs> um, I don't remember the name of the website, but um, I've run into a situation where someone I know had requested a reasonable accommodation to work from home, um, but based on the type of request, like for the reason that they were making, their employer basically just used the list online. I can't remember the website. Um, and then they essentially denied her request um, because they were looking at this list instead of actually listening to her. So, um, I don't know too much of the situation other than that, but uh, that's something I've seen happen. Okay, that's great. good Good information. Thank you for sharing that. So there are, we'll get, we'll talk a little bit about accommodations, but first just a little refresher, the Americans with Disabilities Act just celebrated its 30th anniversary this past year or the year before, um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability and employment, public services, public accommodations, transportation and telecommunications. Um, Title I is the employment piece. So it does require employers. So this is important information. And I don't know, Heather, if this um, may relate to your situation or the individual situation, but it requires employers of 15 or more employees. So if the employer had fewer than 15, um, the accommodations or the ADA uh, may not apply to them. Maybe other state rules and, and laws might, um, but, the, but for the ADA requires employers of 15 or more to provide an equal opportunity to qualified individuals, prohibiting the discrimination in hiring, firing, advancement, compensation, and training. And a qualified individual, I, I put the website here just 
in our limited time for these calls, can't really get into many of the details, but a qualified individual is a person who meets um, the skill, experience, education, or other requirements of a position that they hold or they seek to hold, and they can perform the essential functions of the position with or without reasonable accommodations. So we'll talk a little bit about what those accommodations look like. Accommodations eliminate barriers caused by the disability. Um, so accommodations attempt to eliminate what, what those barriers to um, performing the essential functions of the job might be for a person. Um, how do we develop accommodations? First, we need to identify what the essential functions are of the job. Those are a lot of times found in the job description, but we'll, I think we're, we'll talk a little bit more detail about that um, and identify a need. It, Accommodations must be need-based. So um, they're determined by looking at how the symptoms of a disability, or in, the, in our case today, we're talking about mental health conditions, interfere with performing the critical skills needed in that work setting. So just again, to follow up our discussion on reasonable accommodations, just to lay out some of the Foundation, it's Title I of the ADA, requires employers to make reasonable accommodations to a known physical or mental limitation of applicants or employees that are due to the disability unless doing so. And Heather, this is maybe an important piece to your story, would be an undue hardship on the functioning of the business. So there are some caveats um, and the link here that I've provided provides some information about what would an undue hardship be. Um, you know, typically it's cost related. Uh, if it's kind of going back to the golden elevator, you know, if, if an employer is in an old historic building with no, um, you know, elevator access or very limited and someone um, with a wheelchair, needs to um, interview there, the employer, it may not may not be reasonable and it may provide an undue hardship for the employer to create, you know, a, build a new elevator or whatever that might be. It, it might be more feasible that the employer meet with the person in a different location or something. So the idea of undue hardship on the functioning of the business is important. Um, again, not really, part of, of what we're able to get into today, but this website provides some additional information. Um, but it's certainly always important to request the accommodation and to work with the job seeker or the employee around what would be the best accommodation for them, what would be the most helpful and supportive accommodation. And you can, there's some negotiation that can happen with the employer. So how do we develop accommodations, identify the need? Um, does the presence of the mental health condition affect the person's ability to perform in the environment? And in what ways um, does it cause barriers? If so, what are they? And then identify the essential functions. So what are those functions critical to the job? And again, just to briefly touch about essential functions, but when determining if what's essential to the job, um, job descriptions are helpful. Um, they were also looking at the amount of time spent performing the function, um, the tasks that are, or duties that must be completed for the job to be, um, to, to exist. So just to kind of 
provide some examples. The position exists to perform the function. So a person who's hired to input and, and keyboard different documents into a database, um, the ability to use a keyboard accurately is an essential function for that position. The position exists, um, the, the, um, the, the reason the, the position exists is because of that keyboarding requirement. Um, so looking at essential functions is important, um, but certainly the job applications or I'm sorry, yeah, job postings almost always list what those essential functions are. So if you think about your own job postings and what you might have seen when you were applying for your positions, there were, were probably a list of essential functions. And remember, in a, a reasonable accommodation can, um, if someone is able to perform an essential function with a reasonable accommodation, uh, that's that's acceptable to an employer. So another example might be, it might be an essential function for a file clerk to answer the telephone if there are only a few employees in a busy office and each employee has to perform many different tasks. Um, so even though the job might be file clerk, if it's written in the job description that if there are only three people in that environment, then that file clerk also has a responsibility of answering the phones. So any questions so far? I wanna make sure we answer questions, but also kind of maintain a pace so that we can cover some of the material. And certainly using those resources I have listed on those slides will be incredibly beneficial for you to get a more expanded understanding of, of those areas. This is really about um, different accommodation ideas, rather um, a webinar on ADA. Uh, cert you know, certainly I wanna mention that just to frame it, but some accommodation ideas for employment for individuals that might have mental health conditions include um, maintaining stamina. So if someone has a hard time maintaining stamina, maybe there are certain symptoms related to their mental health condition or even medications that they might be taking, but the um, difficulty is maintaining stamina. So my accommodation ideas might be having a flexible schedule or longer breaks or more frequent breaks. So if someone has a 15 minute break, maybe breaking that up into three five minute breaks to allow the person to kind of have mini breaks um, throughout the day, additional time to learn new responsibilities, some time off for counseling if necessary. So if we look at maintaining concentration, reducing distractions in the workplace or allowing the use of white noise or sound machines, um, if that's a difficult, if maintaining concentration is difficult. I've worked with individuals in the past too we're working in large warehouses and maintaining that concentration was very difficult. So wearing, you know, a headset with, or um, ear earphones with different music was something that the employer allowed for this person. And it was able to really help him um, maintain concentration and complete what he needed to do. Dividing large assignments into smaller tasks and goals. So these are just some suggestions and um, obtained from the job accommodation network, which we'll talk about. But here's some. Um, what are some other suggestions or examples? Oh, I just saw something in the chat that looked interesting. Uh, Dawn, I'm I'm curious about how many people have had people on their caseload who needed accommodations and how often. Yes, let's throw that question out there. How many people, you can raise your hand or type in the chat, how many people have worked with individuals who've needed accommodations or you've helped support getting accommodations and how often? So how many people have needed accommodations 
and how often does that happen with people that you're working with? And as you're answering that question, some of these accommodations may not need to be formally requested. It's always good to have that formal request in writing and have that in your in the person's personnel file. But some of these might be accommodations or supports that employers provide across the board, that employers provide for all employees. So flexible scheduling. Um, that may be something that employers informally provide. Maybe they don't have a policy or maybe they do have a policy, but they have practices in place to allow all employees to have flexible scheduling. Sonia, your hand is raised. Uh, yes. Hello. I was going to say, um, uh, I think Heather asked the question of how do you explain to someone that anxiety uh, qualifies as a disability? Um, if I have if I have the wrong person who, who typed that, um, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, we have, uh, at DVR, all of us carry a copy of the DSM uh, with us at all times. And um, as a, a employment, uh, business engagement employment uh, specialist, um, basically my job is to show businesses, you know, these are very real disabilities that come with very real symptoms and consequences if those symptoms are not addressed. And that usually silences the argument um, because it's coming straight from the textbook. Yes. And, you know, always have a, a Cliff Notes version of uh, ADA law mm -hmm. in, you know, your back pocket. But um, we have uh, basically a, a, a pretty foolproof way of tackling this problem with the employers, uh, which is to immediately, um, I guess, address their concern yes. and say, you know, you have a business to run. And at the end of the day, you have people who are relying on you for their employment. And if we were to send someone to you who cannot do this job, just to say that it's inclusive hiring we are placing them and you in a very difficult situation, uh, which could have potential consequences for all three parties. And that usually uh, relaxes them long enough so that they can hear, we understand what your concerns are and they're valid. And here's what we do, you know, yeah. to take responsibility for um, what we're trying to advocate. And I found that that opens more doors than, you know, when someone Here's, hey, this is Sonia calling from, you know, DDR, I'm your business specialist. They immediately close up because they think we're a regulatory agency or they think that we're, um, you know, we're uh, going to check on them. We're going to, you know, monitor everything they're doing or, and unfortunately, even in 2023 today, the common uh, mental picture of disability is either a, a wheelchair or someone with cerebral palsy, or mm -hmm. someone with Down syndrome. And I don't know who in the chat mentioned it first, but not all disabilities are visible. Yes. Um, yes. You know, or I think I think one of the new terms they're, they're using right now is apparent. Um, apparent. Yes. Yeah. But um, that's uh, basically how, how we approach it uh, from the DDR end. I love that. Thank you, Sonia. I was just out yesterday in the, in the, uh, doing some job development with a provider and you know like you said kind of mentioning it as uh we're a career I had spoken with a provider and she was comfortable describing what her role is as I work with a career development I'm, I work with individuals around career development identifying um you know what the careers the person is interested in pursuing and kind of coming at it from that um, and refer to the health home services document. Oh, Francie, I, okay, thank you. But again, kind of coming at it from less of a regulatory or, or formal um, organization and her organization was a behavioral health organization, but really just letting the employer know that you're, um, it's just as important for you for it to be a good job match as it is for the employer. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, looks like some, uh, here in the chat. Let's see. Wow, a lot came in. 
So in response to that question, uh, Tina, I've, I have one that will need to use the tablet to talk. He will need to learn to use it when, and the people he works with will need to learn to work with him and his tablet. Yes, great example of an assistive technology type accommodation. Dawn, I've had more of what you mentioned, Joni, than actually asking for accommodations. Employers that notice a change needs to be made. My sense is that a third of the people working in our department have some kind of accommodation. My entire caseload has physical and or mental health disabilities. Absolutely agree. Yes. Um, so a great question posed, Dawn. Um, it's very clear that people you're working with um, can benefit from accommodations. And here are some additional accommodations and the job accommodation network. I don't know, maybe it's show of hands or even in the chat, how many people have used or are familiar with the job accommodation network, but it's a resource that is very valuable and similar to what Sonia was saying about the DSM, the job accommodation network also lists disabilities that are covered under the ADA and they list different accommodation ideas and they have suggested accommodations based on different specific disabilities. So it's really helpful. Um, oh yeah, Heather, I thought that that might've been the website. So that's unfortunate that they were using it in a way that was um, unhelpful and not necessarily useful for the situation that you were, you were talking about, but yes, it's for employer employees and also employers um, and job seekers and professionals. And they have different individuals who are expert in certain, um, certain areas. So they have someone that has an expertise in mental health conditions, someone who has an expertise in, expertise in other disabilities, and you can actually engage in a chat. So the, the, um, website is listed at the end, you can talk with someone and, and, and get their expertise of how specifically to go about requesting an accommodation. Um, here's kind of a, a script that they provide as a way to make that request to an employer. So working with job seekers, you can help them look at what their positive attributes or strengths are first. Again, this is just a, a guide. Um, and more information can be found using the link below, identify what the limitations are that the person might encounter at work because of their disability, what accommodations have worked best in the past and why. So helping the person think about what are some supports or workplace accommodations, whether they were formally requested or um, in your discussions with the person, what has worked to help them perform better. Um, and then, this idea of, you know, consider how disclosing can help the business employer and your coworkers. I think to Sonia's point a little earlier, kind of consider how um, not disclosing specifically your mental health condition, but requesting that accommodation. How can receiving this accommodation help the business, help the employer, help coworkers? What, what's the, what are the positive impacts of you being able to perform the job with this accommodation. So helping the person think about what that might be and ending, ending with positive scripts. And you can use that link and get some additional information on that. Again, more information, um, but you can, you know, there's lots out there on how to make those requests. But for our purposes today, we really want to look at what are the employment implications? So what are those implications of um, that? What are those, how, how does the mental health condition or symptoms related to a mental health condition or maybe even the treatment uh, that the person's receiving, medication and so on, how do they impact the, the job? So um, the employment implication of a mental health condition is how the related symptoms affect the worker in the work setting, maybe outside of the work setting or in completing the different tasks. Um, it will vary by environment, it can and will, and it can and will vary by job description and by the nature of the mental health condition. So this is to say that it's not a one size fits all, um, you know, just because 
one person with one specific type of mental health condition or barrier um, used a certain accommodation in one environment, it doesn't necessarily equate to that being useful or effective in another environment. So it's very individualized. So uh, yes, Sonia. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, back in on the previous screen, talking about the implication and uh, the questions that you had listed, I wondered, is it uh, just to get your opinion and the opinion of the room, um, is this something that the candidate should bring up during an interview? If they get to the interview process, um, it, is this something, I know legally they don't have to disclose it, but it is, a, it, is that a good time perhaps to say, okay, so after presenting their qualifications to, you know, basically disclose their disability? I think it's risky at that point. And again, that's my personal opinion, but, but certainly not just my own gut feeling. The literature around that often says that employers are reluctant to hire individuals with certain types of disabilities. You know, there's been a lot of research around looking at employers' perspectives on hiring someone with a mental health disability compared to someone with a physical disability, and the employer is more willing to uh, hire someone with a, a physical disability. Um, you know, there's other research that supports the idea that stigma exists. Um, employers are uncertain or unaware of different mental health conditions. So I would certainly advise the person to be very mindful of how they're presenting any type of mental health condition. Um, we do a, an entire webinar on managing personal information and employment. So maybe we want to put that on the schedule sometime soon, but you know, that's a very delicate disclosure. Once you disclose, you, of, of course, I'm I'm stating the obvious, you, you can't take that back. Um, and I guess the person would really want to be very clear on what the intent of their disclosure might be. Why, what, what personal information would be relevant or import, important. Certainly if it's a, a, a job that values the person's peer uh, being a peer, and if if that's part of the job, then then maybe that's you know, the, there's value in disclosing that. Um, I don't know. Maybe others have different thoughts, but I think that's. Does that answer your question, Sonia? Yes, thank you. What, what are your thoughts, or have you? Is it something that you're just thinking about now? And well, um. I have, I've, I've had a few customers who it's a little difficult to mask their disability yes, yes. and rather than sit with the elephant in the room yes. and not address it head on because they can see the person yes. in front of them getting uncomfortable. And yes. uh, so uh, one of the customers asked my opinion, I said, you know, I've found good results from just tackling something head on. And, you know, addressing it and not acting like it's not there. But another problem you run into is, is that the last thing that the employer is going to remember from that interview is that this person has schizophrenia or this person right. has severe PTSD from, you know, a deployment or, um, you know, this person has uh, Tourette's. I mean, it and and completely, you know, forget the fact that, you know, they, they are more than qualified to do the job. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case case basis, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. And I think, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be specific of what the actual uh, diagnosis is, you, you know, and if it's something that is apparent um, and that, like you said, it's kind of the elephant in the room and um, the person fears that the employer might see whatever that physical manifestation of either a symptom or, or, side effect of medication, perhaps, um, you know, and I've worked with people who have said to this, something to this effect, or have had job coaches say something to the effect of, you know, I know that you might notice that this is occurring, or I have, you know, whatever, whatever that apparent 
thing is, um, I just want you to know that it's due to, um, you know, a medical condition that I'm that's now um, resolved, um, or treatment from a medical condition that's now resolved. But I assure you that I can do the the tasks and and skilled for this position or or some something along those lines. Agreed. May yeah, I have a, a progressive attitude about it? Yeah. Yes, and certainly, you know, it. it it's the, the the value of that would be to practice with the person. What are they comfortable saying? How are they, how do they want to describe whatever that apparent feature might be? Um, mm -hmm. Really sit with them and identify, you know, what would be the best way and, and sandwich it between positives and strengths and skills um, and really talk through those pros and cons of doing that. Um, but yeah, I think you're right it, 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 on a case by case basis. Um, for some people, that might be the 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 thing that helps them get the job um, to to kind of bring up something that the employer might be seeing that might be apparent. Mm -hmm. In job development training, um, we've always discussed the fact that that media hasn't been our friend. If you say the word to an employer, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. do they form and fuzzy feelings? Absolutely not. And and so rather than you know, providing information about that diagnosis to discuss. I'm 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 a little disorganized, and what I found is a checklist. Yes. Or I get I'm easily distractible, and you had mentioned the accommodations earlier for things like headphones or listening to soothing music, and um, yeah. so to avoid because the most employers don't understand a lot of the the diagnoses anyway. They really don't know what that means, mm -hmm. but they do understand the behaviors that it causes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can also say, here's here's what it causes for me and here's how I've resolved that, then, then it's a win-win all the way around. Yeah. But you'd have to really work with the person as, as to what is most comfortable to them and yeah. playing out those pros and cons and but yeah, I, I think that these are all good points and maybe Dawn making me realize we need to put that managing personal information on the schedule sooner than later. Absolutely, because that's huge. It, it's it's a, and and if not fully thought through, it can really create problems for yeah. a person. Not just in hiring, but advancement opportunities. Absolutely. Adding more responsibilities to the person's job. Um, may all be impacted by um, inadvertent or unprepared disclosures. So if we look at kind of employment implication that we just discussed, so maybe someone has a hard time screening out external distractions, it might look like an inability to block out sounds or odors, which interfere with focusing on tasks, the barriers it causes, um, the worker might not be able to concentrate in a team meeting, um, they might not be able to focus on reports if their desk is in a high traffic area, coworkers might keep interrupting them. So you're, you're kind of helping the person identify what are some of those difficulties that they might be having in this case, screening out external distractions. And that might be through discussions with the person about past jobs, other experiences, maybe in school or other types of, um, areas in their life that could help you better understand what some of the barriers might be. Um, and then you're kind of looking at what those barriers are and then helping to look at different accommodations. Um, so, you know, this is just for our purposes, the, the mental health condition here is schizophrenia, the symptoms that the person experiences might be diminished emotional expression or diminished speech. The functional implication might be interacting with others and some different accommodation ideas might be word completion software using its, you know, that assistive technology, on-site mentoring, and so on. So you can kind of see how you're kind of looking at what the mental health condition is, some of the symptoms that the person experiences, and how do those symptoms actually impact functionally the person um, on the job? What's the limitation? And then what are some of those possible accommodations using the accommodations that are listed in, here's an example that you might, we can do this at a later, you know, maybe in a, a future call, um, 
we had so much interaction, we didn't really need to have this, but here's a blank worksheet for you to use. Um, but many of these resources through Jan list what the um, different implications are and what are some accommodations that are very useful. I would suggest looking through that. Um, and then it looks like we're just at the end. But before we go, please, if there are any comments or questions, I also would love if you could fill out a survey that we're doing with Washington State to examine um, or gather input about these learning communities. And I don't know if, if you're able to capture the QR code. Um, but if you if you could capture that, that would be great. Dawn, can you? Is it something that? Let's see. I yes, I'll post the link in the chat. Let me just get that. We would appreciate your completing it. If 